Well, this is not intimidating especially going after Simon. This will not be as much fun, but I hope it will change certain things about the way you look at data. And of course, Dr. Chowdhury said that data is not an asset. I'm gonna already start the day by saying I'm gonna challenge that notion. I think data is an asset. But before we start talking about privacy at all, because I was asked to tell a story, I will start with once upon a time. There was a young girl who wasn't really sure what she was gonna do with her life, and so she went to the Ohio State University, because her dad, are, go Buckeyes, her dad went there, and on my first weekend at Ohio State, there was a little pink flyer with a robot on it, and being a super dork with a bowl haircut and buck teeth and the whole nice look going on back in the 80s, um, I thought, I like robots, and it was an educational robotics program where what we used was an Apple IIe Plus, if you guys are old computer geeks, I'm very old as it turns out, and we used a Rico robotic arm, the kind they make cars with. And what we did was I was supposed to be the student volunteer that helped teach the kids a science curriculum. And the kids were a range of disabilities from paraplegic, quadriplegic, some with head trauma, other types of um, disabilities. So the first day, I got to a very small disadvantaged school in Columbus, and I walked up to a young woman who looked like she was a teacher or something, and I said, I'm here from the Ohio State University for the robotics program. And she looked at me like I was an alien. And I said, you know, the one where we're teaching the kids with robotics. And she goes, oh, the vegetables. They're around the back. So, as, as early as 1986, which is not that long ago, we were allowed to call people with disabilities vegetables. So lesson number one on that day. So I kind of still have my gung-ho spirit, and I go around the back. And as it turns out, all code was bespoke code back then, and so it had a lot of bugs. But the cool thing about the bugs in our robotic arm interface, we basically had a little paddle, and the kids would flop a limb, whatever they could use, into the paddles, and they would say to the thing, close, open, yes, no, go. So it was quite herky-jerky to get anything done. But there was one protocol that we didn't count on. So there was a bug that took 17 different clicks, and if the kids went through that 17-click protocol, which is quite some doing for some of these children, the machine would reset. It was a bug in the code. And what I found was, as I was documenting their progress through their science lessons, every single child learned how to memorize that 17 sequence, and every single child would figure out a way to grab a beaker full of liquid, to do something, grab something that was breakable, to do something to make noise, and then they would quickly go through the 17, and if you've ever seen an industrial robot freeze and reset, it doesn't just kind of go like this. It goes like this. <laughs> so there we were in this room, and all the adults, I mean, this is a multi-million dollar machine at this point in the 80s. All the adults are freaking out all around. Everyone's trying to figure everything. We've got the hardware, we've got the software people, we've got the robot people, and the principal's going, oh my god, what's my liability? And there, in the middle of all this chaos, are two people, just two human beings, one young girl and one child, who turned from a vegetable into a child before our very eyes through the use of technology and the use of noticing that our users our people, our users have a huge sense of humanity. And we can think about big data, and we talk about cloud, and we talk about the future of cities, but I love today hearing about things like play, thinking about things like how do we have a more human medical experience? Because that's been really the guiding principle in my career, um, starting out in those days. I went into patent law after that. I'm not as talented as you guys, so yeah, I had to go to law school. You know, if you don't have, if you don't have skills, you better go to law school. And I found myself at Sun Microsystems, which some of you guys should know. I hope that people don't forget us. We went out of business and Larry Ellison bought us. Um, but there, I had a CEO who said you had absolutely zero privacy and topped it off with a hearty get over it. So, you know, what's a young girl to do but say, I think there is privacy. So, I'm gonna read you, I'll tell you another story and a, a mini story within the Once Upon a Time story. This is part of the introduction from a book that I wrote about a year ago. The world is certainly flat. Everyone said so, the government said so, 
The church said so. Your wise old aunt and the richest guy in town said so. Everyone knows the world is flat, except a few explorers, dreamers, scientists, artists, and plain spoken folks who look out at a sky that looks more like a bowl and notice that the ground and the sky always meet for a brief kiss before the observer wanders ever closer and the meeting becomes elusive once more. And shadows and tides and other indications seem to suggest that there might be something more than dragons beyond the edge of the world. And so as it turns out, the world is not flat. There's a seemingly endless set of new possibilities to discover. Privacy is certainly dead. Everyone says so. Rich people with big boats who sold stuff to the CIA, Larry Ellison, in the 1970s said so. Founders of an important hardware company, Scott McNeely. Someone who blogs said so. The government can't make up its mind which person should say so, or if the polling looks right, but it might say so. Even people who invented the whole darn thing, Vint Cerf, have said that privacy is dead, except a few explorers and inventors and philosophers and children and parents and even government regulators look out at a seemingly endless sea of data and they still can see how a person can be distinguished from a pile of metadata. This is true for people who wish to decide for themselves the story, see, it's all I was thinking of you before I even knew you, the story they wish to tell about themselves and to whom. These people see a different horizon. A privacy engineer is someone who sees the horizon where privacy and security combine to create value as a similarly challenge, challenging and exciting time for exploration, innovation, and creation, and never defeat. So this is my belief, and I couldn't write a, a straight up engineering textbook because the discipline didn't really exist yet, so I wrote a manifesto. This is the edge of my creative thinking. But I didn't travel the journey alone. So this is also a story about that same young girl's broken childhood. Yep, tragic. My mom's a lawyer. She went to night school. My dad is a lawyer and an engineer. We are dorks. <laughs> I thought everyone talked about metadata models at dinner. <laughs> Turns out they don't. <laughs> Who knew? When we went out to play as kids, there's three girls and one boy, and the toilet seat would get left out, left up. My mom would run to the balcony and say, Thomas Robert Finner and Junior put the toilet seat down. And he'd say, How do you know it was me? And she'd stand on the railing and said, Raise Ipsa Loquiter. <laughs> as one does, the thing it speaks for itself. So, <laughs> when Scott McNeely said, there's no privacy, and then a year later, a bunch of murderers killed a bunch of my friends in New York, and probably a lot of people that you guys know as well, I had a six-day-old daughter in my arms, and I said to her, mommy's here, mommy's here. And it was the weirdest time in my life. I had booked my own mother on flight uh, 93, and then because my, my daughter was late in coming, I called her the week before 9-11, and I said, hey, mom, why don't you come out on September 14th instead of the 11th? So she was not on flight 93, but a lot of my friends were in the buildings. So I sat there, and I tell this little girl, I'm going to make this world better for you. I'm going to make this world good enough for you. And now you might ask, what does privacy have to do with any of this? Well, I had a big, important guy talking about compiling everyone's information into one giant database, and we're all going to be safe. Yay! And I thought, God, that sounds like the Nazis. God, we've done this before. You know, we've had the right to be forgotten. It's called the Chimer Rouge. It's not good. We have history to learn from. So one of my personal historians was my dad, second author in the book. So my dad was an architect and a security architect for years and years, and so we took what the guys knew from Bell Labs, from DEC, from the beginning, from the big mainframes that kind of comprised the, the, the nature of the idea of the cloud. So anyone who's using their, their email remotely, anyone who's using their smartphones, all of these ideas started way, way before this current generation. So we went back to the foundations and said, what has worked consistently? And that's where we used boring sounding protocols, but exciting and illuminating protocols like United Modeling, or Unified Modeling Language here, I messed up the standard as I speak. And we're using things like system activity diagrams and metadata modeling, which sound painfully dull, but underneath every great innovation 
is the painstaking, painfully dull architecture within. And it's our belief that privacy engineering is taking a new definition of privacy that does not mean secrecy or shame or hiding away. It means the authorized processing of personally identifiable information according to fair principles. And again, for fair principles, we don't have to start anew. We can go back into the 1960s when the world came together and decided what fair processing of government information looked like. We can go back even further and look at what happens in the Code of Hammurabi where we talk about um, one may not peer into the house of another. Even though the technical capability of violating someone else's privacy was there, that's where the code picked up where the hardware could not. So using those same principles is really where we start to align policy as a requirement. We start measuring success and quality along the lines that we build. Kel Shock. Follow the recipe, and the pie will be better. At least they tell me. I can't do that. So someone else is going to have to bake my pie. But it's true for, for software and hardware and unified communication with users who happen to be humans. We don't talk about the end use customer very often in a high tech. But we're starting to say things like the future of cities and the internet of everything. And the internet of everything is going to tell us sometimes that one piece of data. And sometimes it's going to recognize that your data is really kind of like, if you think about a big bowl, big data is the point where the bowl is touching somebody's interface. But inside the bowl is whatever cacophony of experience and thought and adventure that you have. And sometimes you take different pieces out and you share them with different people. That's what the privacy engineer contemplates and builds in a multimodal society. And that's, I think, the excitement for me. So before I close, I'm going to read you one more thing. I totally changed this on the fly, too, because these speakers were so good today. So I've actually written a poem, which will also show you why I had to go to law school. I really don't have very many more skills. It's called, and, and it's under a, a section of the introduction called, Why Should Anyone Care About Privacy or Privacy Engineering at All? And the poem's called, It's Time to Serve Humanity. Humanity is people. Humanity is empowered stewardship of our surroundings, our universe, planet, and our future. Humanity is described by data, data about humans, data about all things human. Data is not humanity. Data tells the story. Data is not power. Data is leverage. Data cannot capture humanity, but humanity does capture data. It's time to serve humanity. There is no one else. We are already past due. And I wrote that, that poem really as a cry for help from all the creative people, the storytellers, the artists, the, the people who can say that instead of having a 25-page privacy policy, we have something that smells like a doctor's office when you open the app so that your mindset is already in the right place. I want music to score. You know, when I say, da na da na da na What's the movie? Isn't that ridiculous? da na da na da na That tells you more than, well, there was this girl swimming along with a bikini, and all of a sudden, a little thing came swimming in. And imagine that it's evocative. And that's what we need. We have an increasingly complex information and data footprint. And without art, without creativity, without privacy engineers and citizens who recognize that the only way that you're going to have an impact on this global economy is to have an impact on the data. And the only way to have an impact on the data is to raise your voice in whatever talent set you have and start communicating with people as if people matter. We'll have better data sets. We'll have better big data. We'll have better cities and communities. So I believe it is time to serve humanity. And I welcome this opportunity to talk to all of you about our special journey. Oh, and, and by the way, we, this is for free. We're not very good business people. So you can buy the paper online, because you have to pay Amazon for the paper. But we've given it, we've, we've free sourced it. You can get it on Nook. You can get it on Kindle or apress.com in PDF form. And so far, we launched about a year ago. It's being taught in five different universities around the world. Um, Oasis has approached us to make this an international standard. We want this protocol to be something that people care about. I want to walk into more boards of directors and say, have you measured your privacy score? 
Do you know what your data asset is worth? Because the asset is worth more than the, the chairs that we're using on our dual book accounting systems today. 50 years from now, it will be ludicrous to run any sort of business without a data profitability score. So with that, thank you very much.